the T-SIMS podcast. I'm your host, Evelyn Lamb. In each episode, we invite a Hispanic or Latinx mathematician to share their journey in mathematics. Today, I'm happy to be talking with Selene Banuelos. Thank you so much for joining me today. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Evelyn. And thank you to the Latisms team, both past and present, for this invitation, and in particular for collecting all these stories for everyone to hear. My name is Selene Bañuelos. I am currently an assistant professor of mathematics at California State University, Channel Islands. Um, I'm a woman of strong Mexican heritage. I was born and raised in East LA and a first generation college student. I'm a strong advocate in mentoring our students, our peers, and in particular receiving mentoring from our peers, uh, building a sense of community within the mathematics discipline, and making sure that we present our youth with opportunities so that they can tr thrive and learn more about themselves and their dreams. Wow. I almost feel like we don't have to say anything else because that was just <laughs> such a great encapsulation of like your life. Um, but actually, I do want to learn more about you. Uh, so what inspired you to become a mathematician? Well, I've, I've definitely, I've always been interested in science. And I think this goes back to when I was a kid. Um, I, I think I was in about fourth grade. My parents used to have these like child book encyclopedias at home. Um, and, you know, we, we weren't that well off. Actually, um, we were quite poor when I was growing up, but my parents always made sure that we had books around. Um, and so this encyclopedia is one of them was a science book. Uh, and I remember reading about the Big Bang Theory there and then just being odd and amazed, like, how the heck does it, this doesn't really make sense to me. Um, but I was really intrigued. And then throughout studying since, again, like fourth grade, I've just always been interested in the sciences like physics, chemistry, biology. And I understood that mathematics was fundamental in, in all of these things. And math was not that easy for me. Um, but I guess it was because it was so intriguing and difficult, I enjoyed it even more. Um, I've always really enjoyed school. And um, I actually lived in Mexico for one year when I was in fifth grade. Uh, and when I came back to the U.S. and I went to uh, our neighboring public middle school, uh, they told me that they were going to place me in like the lower level math. And I, I remember like just being really upset about this because I was like, no, like in Mexico, they do math like two years ahead of us. You're going to, you know, you're going to place me back. This is going to waste my time. And I actually remember I was this like, you know, little 12, 13 year old kid like arguing with the advisor, telling them, I'm going to come back at the end of the semester and you're going to place me in the classes I need to be placed because this is crap. <laughs> Once I was in that middle school, there was an eighth grade teacher. Uh, his name was Mr. Mitchell. He, he really wanted me to continue studying, not necessarily in math, but he just wanted to make sure that I, you know, went to college. You know, again, I, I grew up in Boyle Heights, East LA. Um, and unfortunately, the, uh, you know, the stats of students going on to college from this neighborhood is, is pretty poor. So he just wanted to make sure that I had opportunities that I knew about college and uh, other high schools and so on. And um, yeah, so I, I really appreciate what he did for me to make sure that I even thought about college. And once I was in college, I actually entered as a double major in biology and mathematics, because again, coming from the hood, like all I knew was you could be a doctor, a teacher, or a lawyer. Um, and so I was thinking, well, I don't really like to argue with people, so I'm not going to be a lawyer, but um, I could, you know, I, I, I would like to be a doctor, help people, or um, a teacher. One of my uh, like heroes from my neighborhood uh, was Jaime Escalante. And I know you've interviewed um, Dr. Erica Camacho before. So we're actually from the same area. We're from Boyle Heights. And Jaime Escalante was, you know, a hometown hero for what he did with the students at his, at his high school. Um, so I thought, well, either become a doctor or I'll become a high school math teacher. And once I was in college, I, the first two years or so, I felt at the time that the biology courses were a bit more about what you can memorize, um, and the math courses started getting a lot more interesting. I, I still really enjoy biology. I'm actually a mathematical biologist, so I feel like now it's just kind of came full circle. It was like, I, and even when I found out that you can put these two disciplines together and then just um, to help inform each other, I, 
I was amazed and fell in love with the discipline right away. Um, but I was able to get into upper division math classes by my sophomore year, the beginning of my sophomore year. Um, and so that's when I started making connections in different math courses. And I just, I remember getting chills, like sitting in math class and being like, oh my gosh, that's why that works. Like, and it just, that feeling was really, really cool. You mentioned that you're a mathematical biologist now. Um, did you uh, do mathematical biology in grad school? Yeah, so I actually, um, uh, I went to an REU, a research experience for undergraduates at uh, Cornell during the, the summer of my junior and senior year. Um, and this actually came about because I had two professors at my undergraduate institution at UC Santa Barbara, uh, Dr. Ken Millet and Dr. Jeffrey Stoppel, who wanted me to keep studying. They said, you know, you should really consider a PhD. But honestly, I had no idea what that was. I had heard of a master's before. I knew that college was important. I was already there, right? But other than that, like, you know, post, uh, grad, post undergraduate study, I didn't really know what else there was. I knew of a thing called a master's, but a PhD, I just didn't know or understand. Um, and, and I kept telling them like, no, I want to be a high school math teacher. This is what I want to do. And they would tell me, well, you know, it doesn't mean that you get to close other doors, just go and explore. And so reluctantly, I went to, um, I went to a program during uh, January of my junior year to this undergraduate women in mathematics conference at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And at this conference, I learned of other young girls my age, young women, doing uh, research. So when I got back to my undergraduate institution, I said, well, you know, I think I want to apply for this are you thing. Um, and they supported me and I did. I applied to a bunch and I was fortunate to get into a Cornell program. And that's where I first had my first experience of undergraduate research and it was in mathematical biology. So we were modeling the um, morris Carr system and just seeing the different bifurcation changes that happens in the system. And the morris Carr system is a mathematical model of two differential equations that um, sees like the bursty or the uh, the different forms of a neuron. So whether it's whether it's uh, awake or asleep or it's bursting, things like that. So then in grad school, did you feel like that's what you wanted to pursue? I definitely wanted to pursue mathematical biology. Yes. Um, and it's still, the, I, I threw out that REU. I learned that the area of math bio was really quite vast. Um, it wasn't just, you know, so of course the, uh, neural, the neuron part is like one piece of mathematical biology, but there's population dynamics. There's like, um, so ecological mathematics and things like that. So, um, I, I knew I just wanted to learn more. I wanted to work with someone who did math bio and I made sure to apply to colleges that had at least one person doing math bio, math bio at their university. And what is your research now? I use um, differential and difference equations and dynamical systems to model these uh, physical systems. And for example, I've had projects in multi-patch migration models. Those are more like population dynamics problems, uh, epidemiology. So we actually just have this paper um, modeling the spread of the Zika virus. Um, and then the one I think I've been working on most is the dynamics of sleep and how our thermoregulatory system affects our sleep. That was that's a really fun project as well. Well, they're all fun, but that one's, I think, the one I've been um, more recently spending more time on. And actually, just this summer, I started working with a group of great collaborators modeling multi-drug resistant organisms. So as we all know, these um, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, it's a big problem. Um, and we're actually looking at a within-host model, so within a person's system. Um, not in the level of population dynamics as to what is actually going on in the hospital or something like that. Interesting. So just from my very naive point of view, like sleep modeling and disease spread and like an in-host model, these seem like really, really different problems to me. Are there some mathematical threads that kind of are similar between them or, or are they as different as they sound? No, yeah. So some of the techniques that we use to analyze a mathematical model are similar. So in, epi in epidemiological math modeling, um, most of the time what we're interested is in finding the reproductive number, 
which pretty much means that if I'm sick, like how many people am I going to get sick during the lifespan of uh, when I'm carrying this disease? Um, and that reproductive number could also be translated to other things in population dynamics. And in some multi-drug resistant organism models, that's one thing that you could try to compute. Also, another thing is um, the bifurcation analysis, just to understand the changes of the model, like what, what happens uh, throughout the model if you change a parameter, for example. That kind of stuff is also another technique that is pretty widely used in mathematical biology or in mathematical models in particular. So there are some things there that, um, that some techniques that we use to analyze models that are similar no, uh, no matter like what you're looking at in particular. But, but the, the systems themselves could be quite different though. So for example, the, the model that's, that's governing the dynamics of sleep model that we're talking about, that, that is the morris lakar equation. So every single neuron group is being modeled with the morris lakar equations. Um, and then you just have like this network of uh, these connections between the different neuron groups. Uh, and an epidemiological model that's really more about like um, moving through moving through stages of you know being a susceptible person to being someone who was exposed to the disease and then moving on to an infectious state and then moving on to a recovered state those those things are different but the uh but the techniques could be the same yeah well and i do have to ask because sleep is probably the most universal or, or at least the, the most relatable experience for for all of the yes, things yes we all do yeah. it <laughs> um so yeah what have you learned about sleep what can you tell me today that will help me sleep better tonight? <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, actually, we're uh, interested in looking at the dynamics of sleep, in particular with this theory put forth that our ability to thermoregulate during sleep might be as important as our homeostatic process. So the homeostatic process is like our depensatory effect, like our, our need to sleep, our propensity to sleep. If I'm awake for really, really long, at some point I'm going to crash and sleep for maybe like 12 hours or something like that. So that's the homeostatic effect. And then we have also the circadian rhythm, which, you know, it's just entrained by the light-dark cycle of, uh, of the sun and moon. Um, so those two things we already know affect our sleep or, like, or, or get us into this like a uh, rhythm of sleep. Uh, but there is a theory out there that, that our ability to thermoregulate is as important. And so what we're trying to ask is, if it's as important, then every single mathematical model that's out there on sleep dynamics should, ha should incorporate this into their models. Um, and the way we're doing it is by um, taking the neurons that are sensitive to temperature um, and then incorporating a thermoregulation equation into those, uh, those neurons in our model. Um, and so... One of the things that we've learned, like the, the problem here, and this is why, again, mathematics and biology really do inform each other and um, influence each other, is that we need more data to find out you know, exactly what's going on. And, and actually, there were in the 1980s, there were some uh, experiments with human beings uh, being done during this time, and actually men uh, between the ages of like 18 and 35. Uh, but some of that, actually, some of the results contradict themselves and it also has to do with how the experiments were being conducted. So in one experiment they were wearing um, blankets and all that and so they were actually trying to figure out the temperature within the blanket. In other experiments they were um, the male subjects didn't have any blankets or anything like that on and the room was controlled even up to the um, humidity in the air. So some of the, that data contradicts it, uh, themselves, but what we what is being reported is that if you're sleeping without any blankets, um, just in your undergarments, for example, uh, the best temperature to sleep in is about 84 degrees, apparently. Oh, interesting. This is for men between the ages of 18 and 35, so I don't know if it would be the same thing for us women. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's a lot higher than a lot of people like to set the thermostat. <laughs> <laughs> right. But again, this would be without any blankets or nothing. Just to sleep Right. So maybe you need it cool enough that when you put on the blankets and trap your body heat, then you're at 84 degrees. Right, right. 
Wow. Well, that that's really cool. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, you've talked a little bit about the importance of your uh, teacher who encouraged you to to keep studying math and science. Um, do you want to talk more about mentoring in your career? Oh my gosh, yes. Thank you for asking that question. It is. Uh, it's been so valuable to me. I would not be here if it weren't for people. Sometimes you know, kind of like pulling me a bit more. Like, come on, you got to try this. Um, but just helping me be aware of these opportunities. So here's the best example I'd like to give people when it comes to this. I could have graduated from UC Santa Barbara, gone into getting my credentials in teaching. And that's, again, that would be totally fine as well, because I, I was, I am still very uh, passionate about, you know, the power of teaching and learning in, uh, in education in general. But I wonder, you know, I could have just gone through this whole process, never have met this professor who was advocating for me and who were telling me, like, keep studying. So I could have been a high school teacher with the ability to obtain a PhD in mathematics and not knowing it. But these people were telling me, you know what, you, you should keep studying. And the thing is, when I'm talking about ability here, too, I'm not saying that it has only to do with intelligence because that that is really not the case. I mean, that has... Of course, that's something to do with it, but the drive to do it, the the ganas, as they as they say, you know, we um, like I I like to think about it more as just I'm really stubborn, <laughs> and when I was studying for my PhD, and even when times were bad, I'm like I'm gonna finish because I'm gonna finish, darn it. Um, so I I think that's really really important. So when I talk about mentorship, I also want to group that together with just letting people know about these opportunities. Again, I had no idea what a PhD was when I was an undergraduate. Um, and research opportunities and networking, creating opportunities for our students to network. So one of the, the advice I give students all the time, well, they usually ask me, you know, when things get tough, like when you hear things like, oh, you know, you are in this program or you got hired for this because you're a Latina woman in mathematics. Um, and that's the only reason why. Um, Students ask me, you know, like, how do you how do you get through that? And I said, well, you know, I surround myself with people that I can vent to that that I feel supported with, that they understand that maybe they've heard the same thing. So I advise students create a community for yourself. So when I'm talking about mentoring, I'm talking about mentoring our students, uh, peer to peer mentoring, you know, uh, being mentored by my colleagues, me hearing them out sometimes. And then, yes, of course, like being mentored by actually a lot of the people on the very first Latisms calendar are my mentors. I've uh, they've they've helped me tremendously and I would not be where I am if it wasn't for them. Um, but also the the networking part. Again, how do you find out who these great mentors are, who these pe who these advocates are if you don't go out there and speak to people? Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me this morning. Thank you so much, Evelyn. And thanks again to the Latisms team. This is just an amazing project. Thank you for listening to the Latisms podcast. It's produced by me, Evelyn Lamb, and made possible by a Tensor Summa grant from the Mathematical Association of America. Our music is Volvore by La Floresta. Latisms is an initiative to celebrate the accomplishments of Hispanic and Latinx mathematicians. It was founded in 2016 by Alexander Diaz Lopez, Pamela Harris, Alicia Prieto Langarica, and Gabriel Sosa. You can find more information about the project at latisms.org. That's L A T H I S M S.org. Join us next time to hear from another inspiring mathematician.